Uh, so once again, thank you, Professor Hanuman, for this uh, invitation. Uh, and uh, we have just had a wonderful talk by uh, Pankaj Daga, Dr. Pankaj Daga, and uh, he threw light on how to look at errors in your databases before we do modeling. And that was a good take-home lesson. Okay, I'm going to talk about a, a formalism that we have been developing over several years, and that formalism is named as EVANS. Uh, it's an acronym for Eigenvalue Analysis. And this formalism has been uh, designed in order to, excel, uh, to assess pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics, and toxicity issues, all of these which are central in drug design and in drug, uh, drug discovery. Okay, so uh, now what is the background of developing such a formalism out here? We know that uh, we have various tools to assess the different attributes of drug development. For example, to do pharmacodynamic studies, you have this 3D QSR tools, COMFA, COMSIA, CORIA. For pharmacokinetics, you have these tools, SIMSIP, GASTROPLUS. And to access toxicity of molecules, you have TOPCAT, DEREC, and now as we, saw, as, uh, as we saw, Simulation Plus. So we have a plethora of software in uh, order to treat pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics, and toxicity issues in drug design. However, Okay, the disparate nature of all these tools makes their routine use very discomforting. Many times you need an idea about the bioactive conformation. And that is many times a speculation, what is the exact bioactive uh, conformation. Though we can make intelligent guesses, but many times it's very difficult. If you don't have some experimental method, you have to make a very intelligent guess about the bioactive conformation while you're doing your simulation. If you're doing a 3D QSR, many times you have to use an alignment method that again is very subjective. Many times you have to do very complicated molecular dynamic simulations or quantum mechanical calculations in order to calculate, in order to calculate properties out here. So with this background that, you know, in order to assess the three fundamental properties in drug design, pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics, and toxicity, along with the host of complex information that is required in many of this program, uh, we thought that we could try to develop a universal approach that could help us to treat pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics, and toxicity issues of compounds, all based on the philosophy of quantitative structure property relationships out here. Okay, so the methodology that we developed has the acronym EVANS, and as I said, that EVANS stands for Eigenvalue anal Analysis out here. So here are the various steps, 10 steps in how this methodology actually works. Okay, I won't read these steps, but rather what I'll try to do is to show you pictorially how Evans' methodology actually works. So first you need to, to uh, build 3D structures of the molecules in your database. And that will come from using the graphical user interface of a modeling program, or you could download the 3D structures from some database, okay? Uh, online, okay, but uh, or you could download it from the Cambridge Structural Database if it's available out here. So central uh, to the uh, uh, to the practice of the methodology is the availability of three-dimensional structures out here. Now these three-dimensional structures, as we saw in the previous lectures, need to be carefully looked at for the ionization states, tau uh the group, the functionality is all in the right place and correctly represented, as we saw uh, in the a, a beautiful lecture in, uh, uh, previously out here. We need to curate, prune, you know, uh, as somebody said, as you just said, scrub, wash, clean your data, your, your data before you proceed, you proceed out there. Okay, so once you have the 3D structures, uh, we need to do a little bit of, uh, of energy minimization and run a very short molecular dynamic simulation uh, in order to, to refine your initial 3D structures out here. Now, once we have these 3D structures out here, we need to develop a very consistent system of numbering of your molecules out here because 
your molecules in the database will have a lot of diversity as far as the chemical structures are concerned, as well as about the size of the molecules out there. Some molecules in your database will be very small in size, some of them will be very large, and this is very typical of databases that are used for, for example, for modeling pharmacokinetics, like volume of distribution and clearance and, and half-life, etc. You see that there is a lot of diversity in terms of structure and, and, in terms of, uh, and in terms of size out here. And therefore, it becomes necessary to have a very consistent method of number of numbering out here. So in order to have a consistent system of numbering, which is not arbitrary, okay, we use what is called as a Morgan algorithm in order to number your number all your molecules in a very consistent format out here. So once we have done uh, this numbering out here, uh, then what we do is we calculate interatomic distances out here. Now, uh, let me go back and say that each one of these steps I'm going to discuss in a little more details a little later on. I'm just trying to give you a very brief of this Evans methodology out here. So we compute interatomic and atomic distances out here. Okay, and then uh, we also dig into uh, uh, sites which are able to predict the physical chemical properties, okay, like a dragon or paddle descriptors for all of these molecules out here. And then we construct what we call as a PD matrix, as you can see out here. So in this top row are basically atom numbers, and in this first column here are basically atom numbers out, uh, out here. And then you have a diagonal of this matrix. The diagonal of this matrix is actually populated with a physical chemical property. It could be anything like lipophilicity, log P, C log P, or A log P. You could populate along this diagonal. And in the off diagonal are actually all these distances which are computed. Okay, I'll be talking about more about these distances that are in the upper half of the diagonal and on the lower half of the diagonal out here. So we call these our PD matrices, physical chemical cum distance matrices out here. So you can see the off diagonals represent the distances between the atoms and the diagonal is actually populated with a particular physical chemical property. That could be lipophilicity, it could be an electronic prop uh, electronic property, it could be a, uh, it could be it could be any it could be any uh, uh, anything. Okay? So once we have these matrices, then what we do is we convert these matrices into the variance and covariance matrix, then we diagonalize the matrix, and that diagonalization of the matrix then produces us what are called as the eigenvalues and the eigen and the eigenvectors. So that's how the methodology derives its name. So I repeat this, diagonalization of the PD matrices gives you eigenvectors and eigen, eigen, uh, eigenvalues out there. So and presently, we are only using the eigenvalues that are obtained from diagonalization of this PD matrices in order to correlate to the activity that is pharmacodynamics, to the toxicity of the molecules in the database, or to the pharmacokinetic properties of the molecules into the database of that. Of course, we build individual models for, for each one of these things. So we'll have a model where we correlate the eigenvalues using some chemometric analysis Okay, it could be a linear or a non-linear uh, non-linear methods. Okay, uh, and we'll correlate it with the activity. Then we develop another model uh, where we correlate the eigenvalue descriptors to the toxicity, and uh, a third final model where we correlate the eigenvalue descriptors to the pharmacodynamic uh, to the pharmacokinetic properties of the of the molecule out here. Okay, so we use uh, chemometric methods that are both linear and non and also non so that we can have non-linear modeling out here. Okay, so uh, as I said, uh, the central dogma is basically the extraction of these eigenvalues and eigen and eigenvectors. And as you recall, the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors have been obtained from the PD matrices, which are actually an amalgamation of molecular and atomic physical chemical properties along with. 3D structural information out here. So they are, they are a rich source of information because they contain not only physical chemical properties about the molecules, but they also contain and embody the 3D structural information of your molecules out here. So there is a rich source of information in the eigenvectors and in the eigenvalues, and then we thought that this information will help us to be able to correlate with your pharmacodynamics endpoints, or with the pharmacokinetic endpoints, or with the toxicity, or with the toxicity endpoints. Okay? Fine out here. Okay. 
So, uh, so as I said this, I don't want to repeat uh, once again, okay? The most important thing is building very accurate molecular structures out there. And as, I, uh, and as we heard from the previous speaker, and I reiterate that, we must be careful to wash, to scrub, to clean these molecular structures, take care that there is no errors in any of these molecular structures, and they have been properly represented by the iodization states in the tautomeric forms, in the tautomeric forms, et cetera, et cetera. Then as I said that, uh, we need to uh, actually refine the structures by doing a short energy minimization, by, sorry, by doing an energy minimization and then subjecting them to a very short simulated annealing, annealing protocol, that is your molecular dynamics. Then from this molecular dynamics uh, trajectory, we extract the lowest energy structure, and on this lowest energy structure, we apply the Morgan algorithm. As I said, the Morgan, uh, Morgan algorithm is a method for uniquely numbering all the numbering the atoms in our molecules, in all our molecules, in a very consistent way. Now I talk a little bit about this um, about this molecule uh, about this Morgan algorithm out here. So let's take an example out here. Okay. So we have this molecule which, has, which basically has some extra functionality out here and another and another functionality out here. Okay, this is a hypothetical model. Don't uh, hypothetical structure molecule. Don't worry ab ab about it out here. Okay, so let's look at the connectivity. Atom O1 has one bond. Okay, and therefore we have this single connectivity. This atom basically has two bonds. Okay. And we'll basically have uh, uh, the double bond is represented as a single bond, so the connectivity is basically also one. So double bonds and single bonds are treated actually as one, and triple bonds are also treated as one connectivity. Now well, let's look at this carbon. It is connected to this oxygen atom one. It is connected to this oxygen atom two, and it is connected to this carbon atom three. And therefore, it has a connectivity value of three. Let's look at this atom out here. It is connected to this carbon atom one, to this carbon atom two, and to this carbon atom three, and therefore the connectivity, and therefore the connectivity is three out here. Okay, so let's look at this atom. This atom is connected to this atom one, and is connected to the other atom, second atom, and therefore its connectivity value is two out here. So to begin with, okay, in the first structure, in the first structure representation, we have all these uh, all the atoms with their respective connectivities, one, two, and three. So we see that n is equal to three is a number of, u of unique atom connectivities, which is one, which is two, and which is three. We go on now, uh, uh, <coughs> doing it, doing it once again. Okay, so let's look at atom number three. So atom number three now. Okay, so three. Okay, let's look at uh, let's look at atom number three. So atom number three now has basically five. Okay, its connectivity is, uh, is five because it is now three plus one four four plus one five, and therefore it gets a new connectivity as as five. Now let's look at this at, at this atom. Okay, so let us look at this. It is, now its new connectivity is eight. How eight? This is three plus three, which is six. And this six is basically added to, to this two, so you get you get eight. So the new connectivity now is eight. Okay, so now let's look at this atom. The connectivity initially was three, and now it has gone to seven. How do we get seven out here? We get three plus two is five, and here again is two is seven out here. Okay, so now what are the unique connectivity numbers? The unique connectivity numbers are basically six. So we see three, we see four, we see five. We see six, we see seven, and we see eight out here. So as we repeat this cycle, we see that number of connectivity indices changes from three to six, and we keep on repeating this out there. And this now increases to, to eight. So there are eight unique numbers out here. So what are these eight unique numbers? Four, five, five, eleven, twelve, fourteen. 17 and 19. So as we repeat these cycles, you see that the connectivity numbers, okay, the unique connectivity numbers keeps on increasing. At a point in time, when you keep on repeating this, you see that you have convergence, that the number of, of unique, okay, connectivity numbers doesn't increase, okay? So you set it down to, to 11. So even after you repeat this cycle several, uh, several times, okay, you sort of come to convergence where the number of unique, where, where, where the, uh, uh, yeah, uh, the number of unique connectivity numbers, okay, stabilizes to some, to some value. In this case, it stabilizes out to seven. So we can stop this process now out here and now start 
numbering our atoms out here. So we look at the highest connectivity number, that is 104. So we give this carbon atom 1. So what is the next highest number? The next highest number is 92. So this atom gets basically 2 out here. What is the next highest number? The next highest number is 73. So this carbon atom actually gets number 3 out here. So now you see we have now numbered our atoms in a molecule very unique, uniquely. So what we have to do is apply the Morgan algorithm to every molecule in our database, whatever it be. So if you have 100, 200, or 300 molecules in, your, in our database, all of them have to go to run through this Morgan algorithm out here, and they have to be very uniquely numbered. And remember that this is consistent. Whatever is your chemical structure, whatever is the size of your molecule, the Morgan algorithm is very consistent in how it numbers, in how it, it numbers the atoms in the molecule out here. So, in other words, we have a very standardized way of numbering an atom. This is not done any, any arbitrary out here. And this is important out here because now we are going to use these numbers, okay, these atomic numbers in order to com compute interatomic distances, distances out here. Okay? So here I'm back again with the PD matrices. As I said out here, in the first row you have the atom numbers. In the first column here you have also the atom numbers out here. And along the diagonals, basically you have your physical chemical properties, which is uh, proper, uh, uh, which is populated out here. And in the off diagonal cells, you basically will will populate it with the interatomic distances. So in this here you'll have the distance between atom number one and atom number two. In this cell, you'll have the distance between atom number one and atom number three. In this cell, you'll have the distance between atom number one and atom number four. Now, incidentally, out here, okay, this the number in this cell will be the same as, as in this cell because it is the same distance between atom number one and atom number two out here. However, okay, if we have uh, molecules which have a large number of chirality, then you'll begin to see that the off-diagonals and the, uh, sorry, the off-diagonal elements are not the same. And I'll explain that a little later on. Yeah, the first important thing is how we calculate these distances between the atoms. How do we calculate the distance between atom number one and atom number three out here? Okay, we use a slightly different methodology out here. And this is the methodology which is also adopted in distance geometry. If you know uh, distance geometry is a method of converting 2D structures into 3D structures, okay? Distance geometry was actually invented by uh, Professor Clippin at uh, University of Michigan at Ann Arbor out here. So how are these distances computed for? The first thing is to compute the centroid of the molecule. So here is the centroid, is the centroid of the molecule out here. Now let's take atom number 1 and 2. And I actually want to compute the distance between atom number 1 and 2. And that is what I want to put it here. What is this distance? Okay. Normally, we would have taken the distance between atom number one and two is equal to the bond length. But we do not do that. Okay. We do not. What we do is we compute the centroid, okay, of atom number one and two. So this is the centroid of atom number one and two. And now we compute the distance between the centroid of atoms number one and two with the centroid of this molecule. And this distance is actually filled in is filled in this value out here. So it is not a simple interatomic distance out here. So actually it is a little more complex, okay? We actually use centroids in order to compute this in order to compute this distances out here. Okay, the reason why we do this is we do not want to bias this distances on any particular atom out here, and therefore this is actually done. So if you look back and read a little bit about the distance uh, geometry algorithm, you'll see that it's uh, very analogous to what we are doing out here. Okay, likewise, if you wanted to compute the distance between atoms number 4 and 12 out here, we compute the centroid, okay, of these two atoms, and then we take the distance between the centroid of these two atoms and the centroid of the molecule, and this is the number we will basically, we'll basically fill in in the list between, between 4 and 15 out here. If there is a 15 atom number out here, in that cell, you will fill this, you will fill this, this number out here. As I said now, for a simple molecule that is a chiral or that has just one chiral center, this the value in this cell and the value in this cell will be exactly identical. Okay, that means the cells here in the upper half of the diagonal we have exactly equal values to the values in the lower half of the diagonal out here. However, if you have chiral molecules, molecules with more than one chiral center, and very obviously. It will definitely have that in your data set out here. 
we thought that we should also be able to treat chirality in our formalism out there. So what we do is, okay, as you can see here, okay, here is an example of a PD matrix where all the distances have been computed out here. This is an a chiral molecule, and therefore you can see very similar uh, distances out here. So the distance between 1 and 10 is 2.07. And likewise, the distance here between atoms 1 and 10 is also 2.07 because this is an a chiral molecule out here. To see that the diagonal has been left blank now, I will talk about that a little later on. As I told you, that we are going to fill a particular physicochemical property in the diagonal. For example, this could be, for example, the HOMO energies. This could be, for example, the log P, et cetera, et cetera, any one of that out here. Okay, now in order to account for chirality out here, and this is a very, uh, uh, you know, tricky, part in, in most QSA programs, how do you treat chirality, especially when, you know, the activity has been determined for the racemic molecule out here, and then you're trying to represent a, a 3D structure, and you're often perplexed, should you represent the R configuration, should you represent the molecule in the S configuration, and what should be the biological activity, when it has been tested for the racemic compound, should I put the biological activity equal for the R isomer or for the S isomer out here, and these are issues which are not, uh, which are not easy to Normally what people do is, you know, you, uh, uh, for a chiral molecule, they build one of the structures and they assign the activity for the uh, for the racemic molecules to the R or to the S and they use the modeling for that. Now that's very wrong out here, uh, out here. you know that, okay? It's, uh, uh, it's not correct out here. So we thought about treating chirality out here. So what we, did, uh, what we did is, if you have a molecule of more than two chiral centers, we build the structures for all of the stereoisomers. So, for example, if there are two chiral centers, you'll have four stereoisomers, you'll have RR, SS, RS, and SR. You have these four stereoisomers, you build all the three-dimensional structures, you do the Morgan algorithm out here, and you compute the distances for all of these, all, all of these stereoisomers out here. And then you begin to see, for example, okay, in all these stereoisomers, for example, for every pair of atoms, you have four sets of distances out here. And then you take the lowest value of that distance and you populate a gear out here. Okay, for example, so let's look at this distance between atoms 1 and 10. Okay, for one of the stereoisomers, okay, the lowest distance between 1 and 10 is basically 1.15 angstroms. And the highest distance, okay, the maximum distance between this atom pairs 1 and 10 turns out to be 1.27 out here. Okay, so that is how you can treat chirality, build all the stereoisomers out here. So if there are basically three stereoisomers, if there are three chiral centers, sorry, if there are three chiral centers, you build two raised to three number of stereoisomers, you build eight stereoisomers, you build all the structures of all the eight stereoisomers, you do the Morgan algorithms for them, and you compute the distances, and you find out for, for a particular atom pair which has the lowest distances, and you populate it in the lower half of the diagonal, and you find out for which stereoisomers for that particular atom pair it is the highest, and you populate it in the upper diagonal out here. So this becomes a nice, intelligent way of treating chirality, of chirality out here. Okay, so as you can see here, okay, so look at this. Look at these numbers. They are all different because you are, 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 are considering chirality, chirality out here. Okay, so after you have filled in the off-diagonal elements in terms of the distances out here, you populate the diagonal with a particular physical chemical property, with a particular physical chemical property out here. And that will be the same number. For example, if it's a log P of the molecule, okay, you'll have the same number running in all of the uh, all of the diagonal out here. Okay, so now you can see this PD matrix has distance information as well as <coughs> physical chemical properties. So there's a rich amount of information, okay, inside this matrix. And we believe that this matrix will be able to capture all those essential attributes of a molecule that can be correlated to the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and toxicity out here. Now, for one molecule, you can build a large number of PD matrices. <clears throat> okay, so let's go back. <clears throat> so <clears throat> for one matrix, I can fill in the log P. For another matrix, I can fill in the diagonal, for example, the ionization value, for another matrix, I could fill the energy of the molecule. In another matrix, I could fill, for example, the homo energies. I could fill polarizabilities. I could fill so many properties out here. So for one molecule, you can have umpteen number of PD matrices, of PD matrices out here. 
I hope this is clear to you. So for one molecule, okay, uh, we can build many, many PD matrices. What is common in the PD matrices is the distances will be common, but the diagonals will all be different for this for this uh, for this PD mat for this PD matrices out there. Okay. So what sort of physical chemical properties we can add, we can add? Okay, we can add both molecular physical chemical properties as well as atomic properties out here. Now, it's possible, for example, you can get atomic properties out here. For example, you could fill it, for example, in this space, okay, for atom number one, you could fill this value with the partial charge of the molecule. In this space, okay, for atom number 10, you could fill it with the partial charge of atom number 10 out here. So you can fill atomic properties or you can fill molecular properties. In the case of molecular properties, it will be very consistent right across the diagonal. In the case of atomic properties, it will all vary depending upon the property of the atom in question, in question out here. Okay, so now you begin to see the richness of the information content that is there in this 3D met, um, uh, 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 matrix. It goes down to representing, this 3D matrix represents the molecule down, right down at the atomic level, in terms of the atomic properties and in terms of the inter-atomic distances out here. So with this rich source of information, we thought we could easily capture, okay, what is there inside this structure and uh, its relation to the, to, the, uh, to the biological endpoints out here. Okay, so here is the, full pool of atomic or physical chemical descriptors that can be populated along the diagonal. You can use geometrical descriptors like number of hydrogen bond donors, etc., molecular weight, number of rotatable bonds, and uh, electronic descriptors like homor energy, lumor energy, charge, dipole moment, polarizabilities, topological descriptors like the Weiner index, Zagreb index, the Hoysara index, all of these things, you know, can be filled in uh, across the diagonal out here. So you have these multiple PD matrices out here. Thermodynamic descriptors like molecular refractivity, atom-based log P, spatial descriptors like radius of gyration, shadow, indices, the juice descriptors, e state descriptors that are actually representing the electrotopological uh, properties for the atoms and information content descriptors out here. So you can actually Built, you know, several thousand of these PD matrices for a single molecule. I hope you appreciate out that. Okay, for a single molecule, actually, I can build several thousand of these PD matrices. And what is the distinction between all of these uh, of these PD matrices is essentially what is filled in as a diagonal. What is consistent with all the PD matrices is basically these distances will be uniform and consistent in all these PD matrices, and the variation is basically. On the, on the diagonal out there. Okay, so having now built and constructed this huge number of PD matrices, all that we got to do now for each PD metri matrix, what we do is we, we, we convert it into the covariance matrix, okay? That's a very standard way uh, uh, of doing it out here, okay? Uh, the variance covariance matrix. So we convert the PD matrix into the covariance matrix. The covariance matrix is then diagonalized to give us Two matrices, one matrix, it's called the eigenvalue. It's a matrix which has only values across the diagonals. The off-diagonal values are essentially zero. And the second matrix is basically the eigenvector uh, matrices. At present, we are only using the eigenvalues in order to correlate with the pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic, or toxicity endpoints out here. And these eigenvalues are basically used as the independent descriptors for our QSPR, QSPR modeling out here. Okay, so, so to sum up, the eigenvalues are rich in information because the encode connectivity, that is the structure, as well as the encode, okay, physical chemical properties that are very relevant to the biological attributes of that molecule out here. So having understood the Evans formalism and what it is all about, okay, let's see now how do we apply the Evans formalism to pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and, and toxicity out here. So our first test is was to build models using the Evan formalism for pharmacodynamic endpoints out here. So we took three data sets. Our first data set is basically molecules, imidazole 1,4 diazepines, molecules with this structure, okay? And uh, molecules in this structure, we have actually a distinction of two, of two data sets, which we label as PD1A and PD1B out here, okay? because these molecules were actually tested for two isoforms of the benzodiazepine receptor, for the benzodiazepine receptor router. So we have two values for the activity, 
and one of them is in place in PD1A, and the other activity for the other isoform is actually attributed to the PD1B data set. The second data set is a COX2 uh, data set of inhibitors, okay, and that is basically with this type of structures, okay. Uh, so, they have been, these molecules have been tested for inhibition of the COX2 enzyme. And the third data set is basically this piperidine analogs, okay. These piperidine analogs basically inhibit the uptake of Uh, basically, they enable the uptake of the uh, of tritium dopamine. Okay, and these were actually models that were developed to understand dopamine inhibition. Okay, by the that transporter. The next one is to use Evans formalism in order to understand pharmacokinetics. Okay, so we took uh, one of the largest data sets that are there in the public domain, having pharmacokinetic data, that is human clinical pharmacokinetic data, and the data that we modeled was the volume of distribution and the, and the clearance. Then for toxicity, to build toxicity models, we actually applied the Evans formalism on a data set, okay, that was uh, on a data set that was actually applied to HERG inhibition, Okay, and the next uh, uh, toxicity data set is molecules which have been used actually to assess estrogen receptor affinity. So we have two data sets for toxicity, one large data set, pharmacodynamic data set, human pharmacokinetic data set, and we have three, sorry, one pharmacokinetic data set, and we have three pharmacodynamic data sets out here. So let me give you the results of how Evans uh, behaves with the pharmacodynamics, with the pharmacokinetics, and the, and the toxicity out here. Okay. Now, as I told you, basically, what we do is the eigenvalues, the eigenvalues are then correlated to the pharmacodynamics, to the pharmacokinetic, pharmacokinetics, and the toxicity using some chemometric method out here. And I said in the beginning that we use both linear and non-linear modeling. So what are the chemometric methods that we use in order to correlate the eigenvalues to the, to the biological endpoints out here? Okay. So basically, uh, we use QSAR INS, okay, in order to do this modeling, or we use the R software environment in order to build these models for pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics, and, and, and toxicity out here. Okay, so more specifically, okay, we use chemometric methods like GA, MLR, okay, or genetic algorithms with PLS, so we replace partial least squares, okay, we replace MLR with partial least squares so that we basically, you know, partial least squares can enable us to do non-linear modeling out here, while MLR will not do linear, will only do linear modeling out here. Okay, so for non-linear modeling, we use GPLS. And again, for uh, doing modeling, we use random forest and SVM support vector machines, both of this via the R, R package out here. Another important thing about doing uh, QSPR is basically to look at the applicability domain out here. Now, the applicability domain is very important because many times QSPR models are used for predictions. Okay, are used for predictions. And in order to have a sense of confidence in our predictions and to know that our predictions are accurate, we actually need to look at the applicability domain out there. Okay. So you can only predict an endpoint for a molecule if that molecule actually lies in the applicability domain for the model that you have built out here. If you're, if you're trying to predict a particular endpoint for a molecule and the molecule does not lie in the applicability domain in which the model was built, then you have to be very careful with your, with your predictions out here. And therefore, the applicability domain is a very important criteria in order to understand 
how much confidence, how much assurance we can have basically when we're trying to predict the endpoint of any new molecule that is outside the training set and outside the test set, uh, the, the test set out there. I'll talk a little bit about the applicability domain a little later, uh, later on. So here is a little bit about now the data sets, okay? So our first data set, as I told you, was the imidazole 1,4 diazepines that was basically tested on two isoforms of the benzodiazepine receptor. And the two isoforms are basically diazepine sensitive, which we labeled as PD-1A data set, and the diazepam insensitive, which we label as the PD-1B data set out there. So here are the number of molecules in the data set. Here you look at the activity range, and you can look at the mean of the activity. And so these are some of the characteristics of the molecules in the PD-1A, the diazepam sensitive uh, molecules, and the diazepam insensitive mo molecules, which constitute PD-1B data set out here. Okay, so what, look, let's look at the models out here. So I'm going to give you the statistics for the, for the Evans methodology, okay, for, so for the PD-1A data set that the diazepam insensitive, sorry, PD-1, sorry, this should be PD-1B, the diazepam insensitive uh, um, isoform of the benzodiazepine receptor, we see the model has an R square of 0 0.88, okay, uh, a very small press, uh, we have a fairly good R-square predict, which is greater than 0 0.5 out here. Uh, the number of terms that are used to build this model is only six, okay? And here is the cross-validation, okay? Leave one out and leave group out out here. You can see the cross-validation also is quite, is quite good out here. Okay, coming down to the uh, 1A data set, the diazepam sensitive isoform of the benzodiazepine receptor out here. We can look at the statistics. Okay, the Evans methodology, the model has an R square of 0 0.86 and an R square predict of 0 0.6 uh, upon 67 out here. Okay, so now one will ask me, okay, what is the significance of these numbers out here? So we must put it uh, juxtaposed to other models that have been reported for these data sets in the literature out here, okay? Then only we can see how good is the Evans methodology. Is this methodology better than the reported methodologies that have been reported in the literature, or are we superior or inferior to the known methodologies out here? Okay, so the first thing is we test our Evans methodology against the very standard QSCR, and that is the Hans analysis. Okay, so we run the Hans analysis on the very same data set, and here are the statistics for the Hansch analysis. The Hansch analysis, analysis gives us a model for which the R square is only 0 0.6. So you can see the Evans model is far superior to the Hansch model. Okay, you can see the Hansch model somehow is unable to do a very good prediction, to a, a very good prediction. Believe me, there is no bias. Okay, we have tried to see that there is no bias in, in applying the Hansch methodology. We did not show any favoritism to the Evans methodology. That's because this is a novel methodology and a new methodology. We tried to give it any favoritism. There was no favoritism, okay? Uh, we did whatever we did for, uh, for, the, uh, for the Evans methodology in terms of pruning the data set and curating data sets and looking and, and, and taking care about the modeling out here. The same caution and exercise and precautions we also use in, in building models for the Hans methodology out here. Okay, so the, for the PD-1B data set out here, we can see the Hans model is not better than the Evans model out here. The same thing happens for the 1A data set out here. We see that the Evans model is little better than the Hans model, Hans model out here. And for, the same thing happens with, with, with the prediction, okay, on an, external, on an external test set, on an external test set out here. So let me look at the models, okay. My next one here is a model. So here is a model for the for the PKI of these molecules. Okay, so these molecules are basically being uh, are they, uh, being tested on the diazepam sensitive benzodiazepine receptor. The affinity for the diazepam sensitive benzo benzodiazepine receptor out here. So let's look at these terms and uh, look at this. Let's look at the first term in the model as an example out here. So here we see the third eigenvector. So so, so the third eigenvalue, sorry, the third eigenvalue is actually correlated to the PKI of this molecule out here. Now, this third eigenvalue is actually the eigenvalue that was built from this physicochemical property out here. This is the radial distribution function. 
Okay, so this was the radial distribution function that was actually populated on the diagonal. And the third eigenvector of that matrix actually is now correlated to the PKI out here. Okay, another example out here. So let's look at this term in our model. This term in the model again has the third eigenvector, eigenvalue, has a third eigenvalue for the physical chemical property, which is actually uh, the number of rotatable bonds. So along the diagonal, what was populated actually is the number of rotatable bonds for the molecules out here. And the third eigenvalue of that matrix is now actually finds a correlation to the, uh, to the PKI, uh, to the PKI of these molecules out here. Okay, so you begin to see now what sort of models the Evans methodology actually gives you. Okay, it gives you how the eigenvalues for a particular physical chemical property is actually correlates to the pharmacodynamic endpoint that is the PKI out here. Okay, here is a model for the PDB1B data, the data set out here. And here you see the third eigenvalue for the physical chemical property is the moment of inertia that is actually correlated to the PKI of this, of this property out here. Like before, again, we see that the third eigenvalue for the radial distribution function for the physical chemical property, the radial distribution function is actually correlated to the, to the PKI out, or to the PKI out here. Okay, so I'm just giving you a glimpse of what sort of models the Evans methodology actually gives, uh, gives you. Okay, this is slightly different from the models that you might, that you are familiar with, especially the Hans type of models out here. Now here I want to focus on basically on the applicability domain, on the applicability domain out here. Okay, what I want you to, to look at is this. The applicability domain was actually built using the leverage methods, the leverage methods out here. And you look at this square. Actually, this square actually bounds all the molecules that are actually contained within the limits of the biological activity. And this limit is basically the chemical space limit. Okay, so we can see what is it? It's a, it's a boundary. Uh, okay, that is contained within the biological activity. As you can see, this, this line, okay, is the containment of the biological activity. And this vertical line here is basically the containment for the chemical space of the molecule out here. And you can see all our training set and our test set of molecules actually fall within this domain out here. Now, there are a few molecules which are outside this domain. You can see one molecule here, one molecule here, and one molecule out here, uh, out here, out here. Okay, so let's look at these two molecules. These two molecules are actually outliers in terms of the biological activity. So there are two molecules in our training and test sets, basically, which are outliers, okay? These two molecules are outliers in terms of the biological activity, and here is this molecule, which is an outlier in terms of the chemical structure. It doesn't fall in the same chemical space spanned by the other molecules out here. So you see the applicability domain actually now identifies those molecules which have a chemical structure, okay, which fall into a chemical space that is different from the other molecules in the data set, or it shows you molecules which have a biological activity that is outside the, uh, uh, the limits of the biological activity that is spanned by other molecules in the data set out here. So this is an outlier. These two molecules are outlier in terms of the biological activity, and here is a molecule which is an outlier in actually in terms, in terms of your uh, chemical structure or chemical space out here. Now, when you are trying to actually use the Evans model, for example, if you try to use this Evans model, okay, this model to predict the, uh, uh, the, the activity of any molecule, okay, whether it is going to be active in the diazepine, insensitive benzodiazepine receptor model out here, you must be careful that your molecule, that your molecule actually lies somewhere in this chemical space. Okay, if your molecule that you are trying to, to predict actually falls somewhere in this chemical space within this rectangle, then you can have some confidence in your prediction for these molecules. If the molecule that you are trying to predict falls somewhere out here, then this prediction is highly unreliable. So now that I've told you what is the power of the applicability domain, I hope that when you are doing this sort of work, you always will, will take care to build the applicable, to, to, uh, to make a model for the applicability domain and see whether your molecules are of all fall inside the, uh, in, uh, fall in the boundary spanned by the applicability domain. Okay, so let me go. Let me go to to the other pharmacodynamic data sets out here. 
Okay, so as I told you, the second pharmacodynamic data set was a COX-2 inhibitors. Okay, so let's see the Evans uh, model. Okay, the Evans model has an R square of 0 0.75, and now we are comparing it with the Hans model. Okay, so we built a Hans model also, and you see now the Hans model is actually as good as our Evans, Evans model out here. So, in case of the COX-2 data set, the Evans formalism, okay, is not really superior to the Hans model out here. The Hans model, uh, the Hans methodology gives you a very good model for the COX-2 data set out there. But recall that, okay, for for these other data sets, for the PD-1A and the PD-1B data sets, the Evans methodology was far superior to the Hans, Hans method out there. Okay. Uh, now, here, we are, here is something quite different out here. So now we see that the R square for the Evans methodology is actually slightly lower than the Hans model. So for the PD3 data set, which is actually the piperidine analogs that was actually tested for uh, uh, dopamine transporter inhibition out here, you see that the Evans methodology is actually slightly inferior to the Hans methodology out here. Okay, is actually slightly inferior to the Hans method. The Hans methodology has a slightly better R square compared to the Evans methodology. And now I hope you believe that when I said that we did not show any bias in treating the Evans methodology any better than the Hans methodology, we gave the equal amount of respect and treatment for both these methodologies. You can see it out here. Okay, so I did not do anything to make the Evans methodology actually better than the Hans methodology in this in these models, okay? As you can see now, now you can trust me, based on these results out here, okay, that the hands results are slightly better, and the, are slightly, the R squared is slightly better than the this. However, however, we must look at this values also. So R squared is not sufficient in order to gloat over a particular model out here. Now you see, the Evans methodology has a much better prediction, has a much better prediction than the Hans methodology. So though the R square for the model, for the Hans model is slightly better than the R square for the Evans methodology, it somehow seems to suffer in terms of the prediction. The predictions for the Evans methodology turns out to be much better than the predictions for the Hans methodology, for the Hans methodology out here. Okay, so here are some models for the different data sets. I won't be going to, uh, through them out here once again. Okay, and once again, okay, here is, uh, here is your applicability domain, and now you can see basically the applicability domain that is bounded by this square is much narrower than the previous one uh, by the by the previous one out here. Now here is something very disconcerting out. Number of molecules are actually outliers in this model. Okay, there are actually about eight or nine of these molecules which are outliers in terms of the biological activity, and there are actually two molecules which are outliers in terms of the in terms of the chemical structure in terms of the chemical structure out uh, out here. But a large percentage of the molecules actually fall inside this applicability domain domain out here. Now I just want to go back and look at what was the data set for the PD. PD2 data set, okay, the size, remember the size of the PD2 data set is 163 molecules, so actually about 154 of these molecules, sorry, 154 of these molecules are actually here, okay, so please put it in perspective, 154 out of 163 molecules actually are, are here within this boundary, and only eight or nine of these molecules are actually outside, outside of the, 11 of these molecules are actually nine here, and about two out here which are outside the boundary, outside the boundary out here. Okay, uh, so again I repeat that, if you are going to use our model, our PD2 model in order to predict, uh, uh, predict the activity, see that your molecule actually falls within this boundary then only you can have confidence in your in your prediction out here okay so now I think uh, uh, my time is running out uh, let me talk about 
uh, let me let me talk about the Evans methodology on on the toxicity data set. Okay. Uh, before that, okay, let me not skip one thing out more. Okay. I showed you that we had actually compared the Evans methodology with Hans analysis out here. Okay. And uh, 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 we were superior than the Hans methodology out here, but we also decided to uh, to actually look at results that have been reported in the literature for these two data sets out there. So for, for data set two, for PD2 data set, basically the COX2 inhibitors, okay, the COX2 inhibitors, uh, what we see that most of the models that are reported in the literature are basically binary classification models, okay? We do not see for the PD2 data sets actually whether actually models, mathematical models that have been published for these two data, uh, uh, data sets. So to the best of our knowledge, okay, we think that uh, 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 we are we have a unique model, okay, for the COX2 for the COX2 inhibitors out here, okay. So this is to the best of our model, uh, to the best of our knowledge, that we have uh, a very unique model for this uh, for this COX2 uh, COX2 data set out here. Coming to the PD3 data set, we see that there is a Pomfa study. That has been done for this PD3 data, PD3 data set out here. Okay, and the Comfort study for this PD3 data set has a very high R square of 0 0.99 and a very high F value. Okay, so the Comfort study reports a very high R square 0 0.99, very close to 1, and an F value of about 140, 1462.3 out here. Now, that is a very commendable model. Now our Evans methodology, no way comes near to this out here. For the PD3 data set, the Evans methodology returns an R square of only 0 0.64 and a very small F value out here. So when we look at the Evans methodology vis-a-vis -vis the COMFA study out here, the Evans methodology does not actually come very close to this out here. But uh, I would actually put a little question mark on this, on this model, an R square of 0 0.99, okay? I don't want to say any more thing about, about this out here, okay, and an F value of 1462, I do not want to say anything about COMFA, and uh, I would only like to say now COMFA is a dead science today, nobody does COMFA and COMCR out there, but nevertheless, since this study has been reported in the literature, I am benchmarking it with our Evans methodology, with our Evans methodology. Okay, I'm leaving this uh, to you to decide uh, or what you want to take up from these two studies out here. Okay, so let's look at how now the Evans methodology favors in terms of toxicity. How are we doing in terms of predicting toxic, uh, uh, toxicity? As I told you, we have two toxicity data sets, toxicity data set number one. Okay, the toxicity data set number one are basically molecules that block the Hog channel. Okay, and you know the importance of this. Basically, these are drugs which are associated with cardiac toxicity, cardiac toxicity out there. Okay, so for this data set, we have basically 163 molecules, okay, with an activity range that is out here. The TOX2 data set, the TOX2 data set, the number of molecules in the TOX2 data set is 89. This is the activity range for the TOX2 data set. The TOX2 data set, as you would recall, are basically molecules that have been tested on the estrogen receptor, okay, on es uh, estrogen receptor out there. Okay, so let's see what we have. The Evans methodology for the TOX1 data set, that is uh, molecules which have been tested on the Herb channel out here. Okay, we see the R square, the Evans methodology returns an R square of 0 0.6 and R square predict of 0 0.45. And this is below the value, you know, the accepted value of 0 0.5. For the estrogen receptor, for the estrogen receptor, the Evans methodology gives a much better model with an R square of 0 0.84 and an R square predict of 0, point, of 0 point, uh, 0.51. Okay, so in both of them, also the number of terms is quite is quite large. We use 10 and 12 and, and uh, 10 and 12 terms out here. So here are the models. I won't be talking about basically about the, about the models out here. Okay, so here is the applicability domain. Okay, and in the applicability domain, we see that there are some molecules which are outside the chemical space, six or seven molecules which are outside the chemical space, and most of the other molecules are inside the, inside the uh, applicability domain space out here. 
Okay, so here are the models for, uh, models for the Hurg data set. Here is the model for the uh, for the estrogen receptor data set out here. Okay. Uh, then we come down to the last application, applying the Evans methodology for pharmaco for for, uh, for, for pharmacokinetics out here. Okay, so the pharmacokinetic parameters that we are model is the volume of distribution and the clearance. Okay, now the number of molecules in the data set that was used to, to model the volume of distribution is 474, uh, uh, and the number of molecules uh, that were used in order to model the clearance is 475 out here. Now, I must say some, a little bit about the molecules uh, that were used to model the clearance out here. Okay, most of these molecules have very small clearance values, zero, very close to zero. And that we feel is actually giving us a problem in modeling this 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 data this data set, as you'll see from the results out here. Okay, so the model for the volume of distribution basically has an Evans R square of 0 0.69. Also for the clearance, okay, the model for the clearance, here are the two models for the volume of distribution, and here are the models for the clearance out here. The R square is 0 0.64 and 0 0.69. However, we begin to see that we struggle with doing a good prediction. Okay, the predictions are not very good. We are the Evans methodology does not give us very good predictions. Our predictions are below the you know the, the limits of 0 0.5 out here. So for both for volume of distribution and for basically for clearance, we have a little bit of a, a problem with the with the predictions out here. Now let me say something about about this out here. Now, there's always a big problem with actually modeling, you know, making models like this for pharmacokinetics and pharma, for pharmacokinetics like the volume of distribution and clearance out here. If you look at literature and you see how many such models have been published in the literature, I think you can count it on the fingers of one hand. Okay, most of the times, actually, all studies, you know, do not attempt to build such models out here. Most of the times it's basically a type of rather regression, or rather a type of you know predicting whether the volume of distribution will be high or low or something like, uh, uh, like this. You don't have equations of this type. Okay, you don't have some exactly equations of, the, of this type out here. So even though we do not have very good models that are, that are predicted out here, but we think that, you know, there are very few examples in literature actually where you can see how the volume of distribution and actually are the clear, and the clearance values are actually related to physical chemical properties out here. Okay, as you can see now here, okay, the volume of distribution for these molecules is related to the polar surface area, topological surface area, to the Crippen polar refractivity index out here, and the Van der Waals uh, uh, size and shape of these of these molecules out here. It is very rare to see such a model where somebody actually gives you insights on how the volume of distribution is actually related to this physical chemical properties of this mole of these molecules out here. Likewise, actually, also you can see that we have now a model for the clearance and the different physical chemical properties. Again, here you see for clearance, we have uh, the topological polar surface area which correlates to the clearance out here. Okay, so such type of models which actually give you insight in how the physical chemical properties are actually related to this pharmacokinetics is very rare to see to uh, to, uh, to see in the in the literature out there. Okay, uh, I must also say that uh, in order to do this uh, pharmacokinetic modeling out here, we had to resort to a lot of non-linear modeling. So we use GPLS, random forest, and support vector machines in order to build some of these in order to build some of these models out here. Okay, so let me give you a summary and a conclusion out there. So you have seen this methodology termed Evans. How does it fare uh, uh, against pharmacodynamics, toxicity, and pharmacokinetics out there? Okay, so in summary, we have shown, uh, actually we have presented a novel methodology which we call as Evans, okay, eigenvalue analysis, uh, which is uh, a hybrid uh, which actually uh, prepares a hybrid sort of descriptors that is a composite of both distances as well as physical chemical properties, and these basically eigenvalues, okay, uh, which encode both 
structure and physical chemical properties were then used in order to model endpoints like pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics and toxicity out here. Okay. In conclusion, we see that the Evans methodology performs very, very well on pharmacodynamic data sets out here. In contrast to toxicity, we see that the Evans methodology struggles a little bit okay, for, for toxicity and pharmacokinetics. It does very well for, for pharmacodynamics, for pharmacodynamics data sets. In fact, it outperforms many of these methods that have been published in the literature in terms of in, for pharmacodynamic data sets out there, but there's a little bit of a struggle for toxicity and pharmacokinetic data, for pharmacokinetic data sets out here. Okay, so let me say something about pharmacodynamic data sets, you know, compared to pharmacokinetic data sets. Pharmacokinetic data sets are very inhomogeneous. You know, if you look at uh, pharmacokinetic data sets, as we saw in the previous uh, in in uh, the previous speaker, out, you find a lot of errors, a lot of inconsistencies, a lot of inhomogeneity in pharmacokinetic data sets out here. And therefore, actually, when one uses pharmacokinetic data sets in order to do modeling out here first, one must weed out all the inconsistencies out here. And as shown in the previous uh, and as shown by, by the previous speaker, I think some of our problems in actually not developing very good models for pharmacokinetic data sets is that there is intrinsic errors in many of the reported values in the pharmacokinetic data sets out here. So with the insights that our previous speaker has given, actually now we will look at if there are inconsistencies in the pharmacokinetic data sets out here, remove all these inconsistencies, all the errors that are there, and I'm confident that we'll be able to build much better pharmacokinetic models out here if we take out all those errors out here. As you know, pharmacodynamic data sets are very homogeneous, very well defined, okay, very well precise. The endpoints are very well precise in terms of the IC50 values, in terms of the PKI values out here. And because of these data sets that are very homogeneous, very well defined out here, okay, Evans methodology performs very well on pharmacodynamic data sets out here. So we have a mixed bag of, uh, of, uh, of results for toxicity out here. As you saw that for the herb channel, we have some good uh, uh, this and a little poor for the, sorry, good for the estrogen receptor. Uh, results are good for the estrogen receptor, but not so good, not so uh, so good, satisfactory for the for the herb uh, for the herb channel out here. So we have a mixed bag of results for toxicity out here. Okay, pharmacokinetic data sets. We have for the first time shown you actually some real equations. Okay, how the pharmaco uh, uh, Kinetic properties like volume of distribution and the clearance can be connected to actually physical chemical properties. We have thrown insights for the first time out here, and we feel that we can do much better after we, we take care of all the problems that are there in this pharmacodynamic data uh, uh, data set. We hope that you know with improvements that the Evans methodology will be a valuable tool, a valuable in silico tool capable of directing drug design and development out here. So work in this area is still being carried out. We have published one paper. Okay, uh, there is a lot more work to be done on refining the methodology, refining the steps, refining the ideas, and also we are working on all of these uh, uh, on all of these parameters in the Evans methodology, uh, uh, methodology. So it is still work in progress, and I hope I've been able to give you a, a, some flavor of what you are attempting to do. Okay, in order to treat pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics, and toxicity out. Okay, so uh, acknowledgments. I need to thank DBT for their funding. Okay, and there are several people who are involved in this work. Okay, my students who are associated with making these models, their names are listed out here. So thank you all for your patient listening. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for nice presentation. Uh, we have uh, one question here. Uh, uh, Mr. Srinja Kumar is asking that what if the input molecules are of varied, uh, of a varied cycle? Then the PD matrices will be different. How to handle such handle such situation? Uh, very nice question. Okay, very intelligent question. Yes. Uh, so you for small molecules, okay, the number of eigenvectors and eigenvalues may come out to be only two or three, and for the large molecules, often the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues may turn out to be six or seven. So what we do is basically we we'll take the minimum number of eigenvectors. Okay. So for example, if um, if the smallest molecule gives us three eigenvalues, three eigenvalues, then we'll use three eigenvalues consistently for all the other molecules. So even though for some molecules we may get uh, uh, six eigenvalues, we'll use the first three eigenvalues for all these molecules to make it very consistent out there. Otherwise, you'll end up with the problem. You'll get three eigenvalues for the small molecules, you'll get four eigen or five eigenvalues for the larger molecules, and there will be inconsistencies 
uh, in, in now this. Okay, so use the smallest denominator uh, uh, to be consistent with the eigenvalues for all the molecules in your data set. I hope that answers the query. Any other questions? No, this is the only question.